Good morning, everybody. Thank you, Graciela, Convenors, uh, uh, accepting this uh, talk, uh, which will be mainly dedicated to the Global Parify Working Group activities, uh, to a presentation and promotion of the Global Charcoal Database. I will also talk a little bit about a new initiative from the Early Career Research uh, Group of the, of, um, the um, Parify Working Group, which is a global modern charcoal database. And then I will finish with a new initiative uh, proposed by the working group about an expert assessment of the risk of fire regime change. And we will have the opportunity to continue to discuss about this uh, during the meeting, which uh, will be between 1 and 3 p.m. today. So first, the presentation of the Global uh, Working Group. We are organized in three focus groups. First, uh, the, uh, working group, uh, the focus group dedicated to understanding fire interaction at the biome scale. And the objective is to explain how and why fire history has varied in different biomes. Secondly, we have a group dedicated to linking past and present data. The objective is to identify the best practice for using fire history data to inform modern risk assessment and manage practices. And thirdly, we have a focus group which aims to using fire history to support biodiversity conservation understand how changing disturbance regime alters species composition and distribution under changing climate and ecological condition. Then we have few cross-cutting initiatives dedicated to the development of methodical approaches and that employ diverse data source and open access database and statistical tools and models. Our goal are first scientific data development, continue to connect, mobilize people, scientists from different disciplines in order to uh, share their long-term environmental data set from natural archive and uh, provide and, and uh, feed a public access database. Then secondly, uh, some knowledge integration develop best practice and protocol for the community in order to facilitate the integration of fire data with other uh, proxies and uh, um, in, the, in the way to understand the complex uh, system and, uh, and uh, interaction between fire and other parameters of the system. Then thirdly, uh, uh, we have the objective for in, uh, in terms of building capacity, increase participation of coding from uh, a different country, in particular in the region where we miss some data, in region where there is not so much data, and when we need, where we need some increasing network and data production, and also uh, promote our literary research activities. So here is a list, it's a very really short list of the last paper published in 2016. There is other, uh, from, from uh, other uh, years, there is new coming, and uh, I'm thinking in particular to the new synthesis from cent Central Europe, Central Eastern Europe, and I, 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 I suggest, invite you to go to see the presentation of uh, Angelica Ferdinand tomorrow about a new synthesis of Phi activity in Central Eastern Europe. We had a workshop last uh, December, and with this workshop, we pass from a short list of series available in Central Europe, about 12 uh, records, to uh, 100 uh, uh, series, series available now, which will be included and presented tomorrow in uh, this new synthesis. The next workshop will be in Montreal, Canada, and dedicated to uh, fire and risk management. And uh, we hope to be founded and to get money for the uh, workshop in uh, Africa uh, in one year, a little bit less than one year, in March 2018, in Nairobi, Kenya, a workshop dedicated to the African challenge. 
The GCD now, so for those that are not aware about the GCD, uh, the GCD contains information about paleophile activity in the form of sedimentary charcoal record from sites across the globe, and we cover the last 100,000 years. The objective of the database increases standardization and rigor and data collection, storage. There is uh, a more than 130 uh, units of measurement in, in, the, in, the, in the viability of record, and we want to increase the standardization to make the comparison and the composite at the regional global scale easier. Get easier access also by the international community, non-expert, and make your work visible. First, the database aim to help you to promote your work and make your work visible. So the goal is also to provide diverse and open source tool for data exploration and analysis. I will talk a little bit more about our package. And um, connect modeler and practitioner and skate order, which is a major uh, issue of the Pages and uh, Hearth, Future Hearth uh, program. Connect the data producer with these uh, guys uh, from model, from, the pro the, from management and uh, decision. And at the end, promote some geographic development. Uh, I already said and talked about that. So just a short view. The database is really simple structure, and uh, you have a site. <laughs> so the site with the metadata, the core, which is really usual for most of you, the sample in the core, and then the charcoal. And we can replace the charcoal by any other proxy, in particular, in this case, five proxies. And core and sample are connected through the dating information to an edge model. Of course, auto contributors are linked to the data, the charcoal, the sample, and the core, and you can find in the database a connection. So your, your core and you are visible in the database. So this is a public, friendly, and community, community database. Uh, if you are just uh, um, visitor, you can have a view with the metadata. If you want to become a user, I mean, so export or download uh, some contribute with data, you have to log in, create an account, get a password, you can recover, there is a system to recover a password if you uh, forget it, and then in this case you have access to all this menu and you can go through the map to the sites and to the data. You can view uh, some, uh, this is a, a chart and a graph that are automatically uh, update with a new contribution, and this is, in this case, a chronological distribution of data. You have also some special uh, analysis of the data available, so you can see where there is data and where data are missing. You can select and export data from a map or from the list as a polygon. You select on the, on, the, on, on, the, on the map, and you can go for comparison in between your production and the data available, so at a regional scale. You can add data. It's a simple way. You create a new contact if you are the contributor and not the author. You create a new affiliation. You input your publication, then you go to sites, core, and charcoal exactly in the same frame that I show you with the structure of the database. The metadata, you will input the metadata in the database with the menu system, and then at the end, when all the metadata have been included in the system through online, you create a, um, a file, you export the file, you input your charcoal information, and you export the you download, uh, upload the, the, the file in the database. And then with this, a good connection between the metadata and your data. To, if you want to go further, you can exploit. The, the database is more to manage the data, not to analyze the data. 
If you want to exploit the GCDs, that means you want to go for composite regional analysis, you have to use the R package in R. For micro regional to global synthesis, you can export a new data set from the GCD and use it in R. Or you can also use the, in the package there is the full version three of the database. We are in between now version three, which is clean and available, and we are working on version four, which is in the process. There is a lot of help and tutorial you can use, okay? Uh, third point is about the global modern charcoal database. It's a project led by uh, Donna Hatton, Julie Allemand, and, Co and Colin Cornet Mostafi. It's a community-based initiative that want to fit into the gap uh, between metric and of biomass burning and current fire regime. Uh, they provide in the paper some standardized protocol to collect and analyze the sample to uh, get them um, suitable for contribution and uh, solicitation are proposed in this uh, paper. The paper is available online in Quaternary International. I uh, suggest, I invite you to read it and if you're interested to contact uh, the, this uh, early career researcher uh, group of our working group. I will uh, move to the end and the expert assessment which is a biome based assessment of the risk of fire regime change and who is concerned, all five experts identify in the literature or inform during this talk. What is the topic? It's a document scientific opinion on the past, present, and possible future change in fire regime and the effect. Why? Because uh, sometimes it's complex to modelize the interaction in between our system and fire and the cause and consequence of fire. And the response is combining assessment from multiple scientists with hypical and diverse expertise that will love an, an, allow an integrative evaluation of the range of possible future, providing a variable complement to the projection from numerical model. So the questionnaire, which is uh, already available and uh, uh, pretty ready to be disseminated, uh, the objective is uh, there is three objectives with the questionnaire. Estimate the knowledge about past fire regime viability. Estimate the probability, direction, and implication of fire regime changes. And estimate expert expectation about fire management in the future. We have 21 questions in five groups, personal information, selection of a region, and then the three term. And the frame, frame, framework is, uh, we have three time frame, short, medium, and long and we consider two warming scenario, 2.6 and 8.5, two opposite uh, extreme scenario. And uh, we have cut the, part, uh, the globe into 14 biomes and eight region, and you can answer three, up to three times for different biomes or different region in the, in the system. I propose to have a demonstration of the GCD, how to download, export data, and a test, the ultimate, the last test uh, of the as expert assessment during our working group uh, meeting between one and three o'clock today in room six. If you want to participate, please come. We are limited to 20 person because it not, it will, it's, it's not a presentation and talk and classic uh, uh, meeting. It is a more practice. So because of uh, technical support, we need to limit. And if you come, don't worry about lunch. Lunch will be served in room for person participating to this uh, meeting. Thank you for attention. Fire is very important in the C4 grass savanna. And to, do, to illustrate that, I show here a map, a modern map of uh, the C4 vegetation. And you see that's a very important part of Africa. And ecological modeling by Bond shows that if you would have excluded fire in that region, there was very little 
Savannah left. Thus, there is a very strong connection, and that is for all, for many things is that uh, clear about uh, about C4 vegetation, C4 savanna, and fire. Well, these types of vegetation, the savanna, grows in the tropics uh, in at precipitation regimes from annual precipitation between 700 and 2,000 years, uh, 2,000 <laughs> millimeter per year. Um, the um, um, what I will try to show you in this talk is that there is a very big difference in the effects of fire on the ecosystem when you are, if you are on the dry side or if you are on the wet side. And to do so, I, I go back to the mid Holocene and show you a marine uh, records, uh, yeah, uh, uh, records of pollen, of charcoal particles, and of stable isotope of waxes. Well, it's well known and it's well do documented that the early Holocene, as you see with this, all these many hydrological sites on the lower map and all the pollen sites on the upper map, the, so the, the, uh, the, 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 the Holocene uh, vegetation and climate is actually very well recorded. And um, especially, as many of you know, the wettest period is between 10 and 5 and a half thousand years ago. On the left hand side you see bin per, per uh, range of latitude and on the uh, and on the x axis there is the the time axis with modern at the left hand side and uh, 15,000 years at the right hand side. Well this African human period, well known, described first in, uh, in marine sites by Peter de Manacle, or at least coined based. Um, so you have also of this record a very good in the marine sites. And recently, Tierney et al. published Datarium records, Datarium from terrestrial plant waxes, in these records, as you see on the right hand side. From these records, they modeled uh, precipitation estimates. And well, there, there might be things about it, but if you believe them, and they look very good, <laughs> you, uh, you see that in the, in the period, of, you see that when I and then, uh, draw lines of 700 millimeter and 2,000 millimeter uh, uh, precipitation, in these graphs you see that the savanna uh, window is reached uh, between 10,000 and 5,000 years all over the place. Well, now I will show you another marine record. Uh, you see on the star where it's lived in very close to the original uh, uh, site of uh, Odefe 658. And, um, and the time frame is in this case uh, 11 to 13,000 years till now, as you see in the yellow box. So this record, Britta Beckman measured the deuterium of higher plant waxes, which is see, you see in the middle curve. And the curve is so oriented so that the weather is up. On the bottom side, you see the work of Lezine and others that bind the, a number of uh, hydrological wet sites in all of Northern Africa. And the correspondence is actually quite good. So we have some confidence in that the Deuterium record is indeed, also this Deuterium record is indeed showing us the humid period. On top you see pollen, uh, relative abundance of tifa pollen. Tifa is a plant that grows in, uh, in swamps and along watercourses. And also that sh shows that there is a good link between our record and the humid uh, places in Africa. Well, okay, of course, we get our <coughs> terrestrial material through, mostly in this area, mostly through winds, and which is very well illustrated by these famous uh, dust plumes, uh, satellite images from the NASA. Um, but there is also another thing from that dust that shows you another aspect, aspect of the vegetation. In in grayish, uh, just below the deuterium curve, you see the carbonate curve. And in this part of the world, 
uh, as always was done in the old work by Peter Domenico, you have a, a more or less a switch between the carbonate, marine carbonate production and the terrestrial input. If the marine carbonates are strongly diluted by a lot of dust, then you get low carbonates. And um, you only can get real lot of da dust if your vegetation cover is not, uh, is not uh, closed. So there is, on the one hand, you have a lot of dust, you have little vegetation cover, and uh, conversely, if you have a lot of carbonate, you have a little, uh, not much dust, and that indicates that you have a much better vegetation cover. So here the pollen diagram expressed as a summary of, uh, of, uh, of the different types and arranged such that uh, after, from north to south after the source area of the, main, of, of the main source area of the pollen types. In brown on top you see pollen types from the Mediterranean, then you have pollen types as Ephrata and Asteracea in, in yellowish um, that, uh, that come mainly from the, from, from the transition zone between Mediterranean and Sahara. Then in full yellow, the Amaranthaceae pollen grains that, uh, that might that indicate here uh, the extent of the desert. In green, grass pollen that might stand for the savanna vegetation. In light green, the sedge pollen that uh, come from wet localities, but also from, uh, from probably also from dunes, so they, they have, an diff have, have, have several source areas. And then in dark green or grayish, the pollen of the woody vegetation, and in magenta, the mango vegetation. In the wrestling, wrestling you see a, a plot here over the number of pollen Taxa, so some measure of the variety of what we see in the record. And you see a nice increase uh, in the earliest part of the record between 11,000 and 9,000 years ago about the number of pollen types, the variety which, which comes along together with the increase in the woodland vegetation. Okay. Now I finally come to the, fi the fire record, or better to say the charcoal record. This is a simple charcoal record, just counted charcoal particles in the pollen slides. And, um, and the, the other thing what uh, is, is put over the pollen diagram, the uh, stable carson, carbon isotope composition from the waxes and a range orientation such that up is more C3, more woody vegetation and less, uh, and less C4 grass vegetation. Um, well, if you uh, look at the different types at the beginning of the Holocene, you get an increase in vegetation cover as, uh, uh, as in the indicated by the estimate via the, via the, via the carbon, carbonates. You get an increase in fire abundance. You get also an increase in grass pollen and in woodland pollen, so you get the establishment of savanna from a desert-like situation, and that difference already drives the stable carbon isotopes in the direction of more C3. Then you get a nice and stable uh, period during the maximum of the African humid period, until about six and a half thousand years ago, when you have a lot of fire and uh, may poss possibly a complete vegetation cover, a lot of savanna, and a, a mix between uh, trees and, uh, and grasses. But then aridity kicks in, if, if you might remember from, from the curves I show before. Um, um, and you get a strong decline in your grass pollen. You get not so strong decline in the woodland pollen. That indicates that the, the, the woody species may be more resilient. 
and that the fact of office that you still get an increase in the relative amount of, veg of C3 plants. However, the total uh, uh, vegetation cover declines strongly. So you get a, a decline in the savanna and a decline in the vegetation cover, coupled with the last large spike of the charcoal record. And that is probably, that I th we interpret so that the charcoal in this period where, uh, where, where there is a strong aridity, uh, the, the climate gets pretty much more drier, is much more destructive. It's not, uh, it's not, not uh, 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 keeping the system stable, it's destabilizing the system and it's probably um, accelerating this desertification. And that brings me, oh yeah, and then the last two things, you get the, with the last drying out of the wet phases in the, in the Sahara, you get a, a, a short drop in the sedge point, and you get an increase, a relative increase, because you have low vegetation cover of the C4 plants of the desert in the, in the last 2,000 years. Okay, well, what I wanted to say about fire is this, Duplicity, what you can nicely see at a Holocene record, which covers both the humid part and the, the dry part. And during the humid part, you get the stabilization of savanna. You keep the mix between the C4 grasses and the woodland vegetation of the, the trees in the savanna. But in the aridity phase, you get probably an acceleration and uh, an, uh, yeah, an acceleration of the of, of the effects of drying uh, in, in, in the, with, the, with the fire that, that might have been much more destructive. Yeah, thank you very much for your attention. You think there could be a temporal decoupling between the charcoal record and the marine signal? So there seemed to be a, yeah. you know, the maximum carbonate, the maximum on your charcoal seemed to be offset. <laughs> So one day that indicated some kind of uh, time lag because of no, the position not, transfer processes. No, that is not the way we, uh, uh, we this, is, this is all on one core. So, um, and the main transport system is not changing much. So we don't think there is, a, there is within the, in one of the same core, time lag between these proxies because they have all more or less the trans same transport system. That would be very complicated. So we did don't it, uh, don't interpret it that way. We we, we have interpreted as if all those things really come come along. But the H model is based on marine. Yeah, but the charcoal record also. The the, the marine the vexes are from the marine port. The pollen is from the marine port, and the, the charcoal part is part of it as well. Mm. So there is this. I showed the results only from one port. Oh, yeah, there, there might always be problems, but we, we, I, can't, I can't imagine not, not that they are there. Welcome, everybody. I'm going to talk about part of my PhD research uh, for the real, the Resilience in Eastern African Landscapes project, where we look at the interactions between climate, landscape, and human impact. And for this talk, I'm going to discuss mainly Lake Bogoria, which is a hypersaline lake in the Kenya Rift Valley, which is located here, where we took multiple cores. And I'm going to mostly discuss the pollen record that we got from the southern basin of the lake. The climate in this area is determined by uh, Migration of the ITCZ, you get the bimodal uh, seasonal rainfall plus additional rainfall in the summertime from the west. And we get uh, on larger timescales interactions between ENSO, the IOD events, and the Indian monsoon, which result in an potential, uh, annual potential evaporation of about 2,500 millimeters with a local precipitation of 500 to 1,000 millimeters a year which makes this a semi-arid tropical ecosystem. On longer timescales, we have the drier periods, the 
medieval climate anomaly and we have weather conditions in the Little Ice Age. And this is a record from Lake Naivasha where we see multiple droughts that have occurred in the area. So when we are looking at the savanna forest ecotone, we have different systems that can determine the vegetation. You can have an equ equilibrium where there's just a gradual transition from the forest to the open grassland determined by the uh, environmental gradient. But more often we find a disequilibrium where there's thresholds and feedbacks that determine switches between different states. And Sankara et al modeled that and showed that there's a, thresh, uh, a threshold around 650 millimeters per year. Below that, you have a climatic driven system where the response of the, the uh, vegetation is following the gradients. You get more tree cover with increased precipitation, but above 650 millimeters per year, there's a flat line. So even though potential vegetation could reach a closed canopy, it remains open savanna which is due to the fire and other disturbance indicators such as grazing, cattle, and things like that. In Lake Bogoria, we have a local precipitation of 500 to 1,000, so we want to know if these disturbance factors determine the, the vegetation in our area. First, I'm going to take a small trip to Lake Simbi, which is a comparable site near Lake Victoria, slightly higher annual precipitation of 1,200 millimeters. And here we see a site that is fire controlled. We have here the diatom record showing the climate reconstruction with drier and wetter conditions at the top. And we see that fire mainly occurs in the intermittent periods where the dry periods are uh, fuel limited and here it's too wet to burn. So when you have the, the diatom level here, again, the wet side here to dry, we see that fire occurs mostly in the intermediate levels. And if we look at the amount of variation of the vegetation that is explained by fire that we see here, which varies from 15 to 30%, we see that it nicely follows the woodland pollen, indicating that the savanna is controlled here by fire dynamics. And we want to see if we can find similar patterns in Lake Bogoria. <coughs> to translate the pollen abundances to actual landscape, we look mostly at the Poaceae pollen because the tree species are all or mainly insect pollinated. And you find this is from Western Uganda, around 65% Poaceae in your, this is from uh, surface samples. You find an open grassland, you find 65% of Poaceae, and in the semi-deciduous forest you find around 35. And we get similar results from this study from Vincent in the Lake Bogoria area. So we use the amount of uh, Poaceae pollen as an indicator of how open the landscape is. So if we move to the results, here we have the summary diagram within green, the Afromontane forest, in sort of olive green, the woodlands, yellow has the grass, herbaceous vegetation, and in red is uh, the cultivars. And we see that there are two major time periods where there's a decline in the grass vegetation and an expansion of the wooded vegetation. And we see that here and from around uh, 80, 1800 to present, there's a huge decline in all the grass. And then we find our human presence. These are the poesy grains of 60 to 80 microns, which we interpret as the cereals. And we see them from around 80, 1500 coming in. And then all the way in the top, so the last 50 something years, we find uh, more human indicators coming into uh, the area. We see some pine, there's maize here. We also find expansion of Cupressaceae, which is pr probably mostly juniper. And we have Dodonia, which is really encroaching the area now. So we also interpret these as a result of the human in, uh, impact on the landscape. And as a result of that, they have expanded. 
if we compare this with the hydroclimatology, we have a reconstruction of the lake levels and um, comparing those to our pollen record, we see that in these periods, three periods of increased lake levels, we find a nice correlation with these three peaks where the, the woodland fraction expanded. So here we see that there's a climatic response of the vegetation. In the modern or modern, more modern uh, time, we see from the moment that this piece of uh, this grass starts to decline here, it also occurs during these high lake levels, and then grass continues to decline. Even though today it is a more dry environment, there's still relatively high lake levels, which is probably due to the human impact in the area. So the the, the landscape fraction makes the water run into the lake and keeps the levels higher. So that happens around this last zone. Here we also have the expansions of the uh, Cupressaceae and the Dodonia in here. So this is not, especially with the Dodonia, not necessarily the entire uh, covering. It's more like a, a human impact signal than, than actual vegetation cover. If we look at the last bit where we have the human impact, the last uh, 200 years, we see this huge peak here. This is the sediment accumulation rates. We find this huge input here, which is due to the increased erosion from the, from the human uh, impact on the, on the area. A little bit before that, we already see higher inputs of clay. These are the, the clays, which is probably the climatic signal, the increasing uh, wetter conditions that also coincide with this peak in charcoal. So we interpret that as the increasing uh, farming in the area, and they burned uh, occasionally here. And this coincides with the, with the improving climate conditions. And then only in the last 50 years, we get this high impact in the area with all the, uh, all the human impact uh, factors. So the real human impact was only really late after the 1950s, even though the human presence is from earlier, so from around here already in the system. But it's very low key. We did a PCA analysis to see how much of the variation is explained in our pollen record by these different factors. And we found here, this is the first axis of the PCA, this is the second. And we find here that on the first axis, mainly POACI are the important uh, determinant. And most of the, this is not all the species in there, most of the species, the others gather around here. And we can also see this in the sample scores. We have the open savanna on this side and the wooded savanna on this side. And here, number three, four, eight, and nine are our zones where we have the expanded woodland. And here are the more open vegetation uh, fallen zones. The, on the vertical axis, we see one of the most important ones, the cupressaceae, who really increase in the top which we interpret as a result of, of more human disturbance. We also find pine, ericinus, other species that are linked to disturbance and to human impact. And here we find, so these eight and nine are the top most pollen zones where all that human impact is visible, where here are the, the oldest. And from six and seven is where the first human impact uh, was visible. So we interpret the second axis as this human impact. We have undisturbed vegetation up to the more disturbed vegetation types that we find. I've plotted them as well along the major uh, vegetation types. So here we have the first PCA axis 
and we can really see that it follows the grassland curve with the wetter periods visible here in the PCA and also here with this decline of the grassland. We have here this peak in the PCA curve. So the first axis really seems to document the grassland expansion and the expansion of the woodland, therefore. The second PCA axis follows the disturbance indicators. Here we have the most disturbance where we have this increase. From here we get the human impact, the, the cereals that first appear in the area. And here a little peak that seems to coincide with some indicators here that are probably just natural disturbance from the changing. And I also plotted the third axis. I didn't show it before, but here it seems to mainly focus on the modern anthropogenic indicators in the top, post-independence mostly. So to conclude, we find a vegetation that's largely climate-driven, but with a secondary role for the disturbance factors in this area, where we see the human presence from 1500 AD and the really dominant vegetation impact by humans from the 1950s. We think that uh, natural fire was mostly fuel limited, so we don't really find any impact of fire on the vegetation in this site, although there was some limited fire during the, the period where the, the human presence increased and the climate uh, uh, improved. Um, but this was uh, not really impacting the, the vegetation composition as such. Thank you very much. The, the Cooper SSA, you said uniperous. You mean small uniperous or the big tree? Uh, I, I don't know that. Do, do they grow in the, the country they, they are mountain? They're the probably from, yeah, yeah, or you have the Cabernet Mountains yeah. uh, close well, by. So probably from there they are the, yeah. But yeah, I'm not exa exactly sure what happens there in the top because it's such a big increase. So I, I, they're not in the area itself locally. So. No. Yeah. Any, any other question? I may have a question. <laughs> if no one else asks. Um, can you please go back to uh, your, um, that diagram in which you were showing accumulation rates? That, that, yeah, yeah, that one. You have a huge increase of charcoal in there. Uh, did you mention that you have ch some charcoal increasing? So the charcoal here, this. Right, okay. Yeah. So yeah, th this occurs so around here as well where we see the clay input, which is uh, up there. Okay. And then um, have you tried to see how that relates to the tree dynamics? Because, you know, I would have been expecting... We didn't do really do see. So here also the charcoal curve. Yeah. And we didn't really find any correlation. Any, uh, any response? We didn't really find yeah. any real response, no, not yet. We still could do some additional analysis to check exactly what happens with the fire, but so far we didn't find anything yet. How, how would you explain, sorry, and I'm finishing now. <laughs> how, I, I'm passionate about this issue. Um, how would you explain that you, know, you have uh, such a good charcoal record with no impact in the savanna when I mean, savannas are system yes. where well, fire is quite active and quite relevant. So what's your idea, your hypothesis on that? We think it because it's, it's, it's too dry, it's too very fuel limited, and therefore we do, we do get fire. But yeah, I'm not exactly sure why it wouldn't really impact. So I'm, I'm guessing there's fuel limitation that... Okay. Worth but, thinking issue, I think. But, yeah. mm -hmm. It's a Sorry. very, very nice worth thinking idea. Yes, think. yes, I think so too. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so, so much. But yeah, this is still the first step, so we'll be doing more. Uh, okay, thank you, Yeah. Yeah, hello, welcome everybody. Um, yes, we are still in Africa. We are a little, moving a little bit south, and uh, we take a different uh, time period now, the last glacial cycle. And uh, yeah, this this work um, in cooperation with Enlo and uh, Gita Laszlo, Peter Kohler, and Paul Vades. Um, well, the two last ones are not mentioned in the program because in the last two months we just realized, okay, we have to change something and they were at it. And that's why the project gets bigger and bigger. And well, um, to be honest, by submitting the proposal, the, the abstract, um, um, now I should say we should rename it and say towards the understanding of the fire activity. So it's, um, there are still some open questions. So. Um, 
Just to introduce the, the area, so on the left-hand side you do see where we have this marine core, where we have um, charcoal um, uh, records in, and we have the elongation records, what you can see on the right-hand side. So that, these are the data, and uh, if you look in the last, um, yeah, just focus please on the last 120,000 years, what you do see is that the maxima and minima with the charcoal uh, do very good correlate with the um, insulation, local summer insulation. So um, there's, that's why um, we thought of, okay, would be nice to understand what are the underlying processes behind um, this variability and perhaps just the hypothesis that fire activity is driven by changes in grass fueled fires due to changes in the South African monsoon. So, um, so we thought let's let's do investigate it by having a model run, and um, as it's not possible to um, have a transient simulation over the last 120,000 years, um, we changed uh, the setup and saying okay we take snapshot simulations from um, Paul Valdez. So that's on the left hand side. On the top you see that there. Uh, we use these uh, 62 time slices for the last 120,000 years and uh, take, took this as an anomaly approach on um, and base climate for a present day climate of the MPI Earth system model. So we can force our JS Bach, which is the vegetation model, including a fire model with uh, the daily minimum maximum temperature, precipitation, humidity, cloud cover, and so on. But you do need to, to simulate, uh, to, to drive a vegetation model, and um, so the the underlying fire model is Spitfire, so I would say it's one of the most uh, promising fire models right now, what we can have in an earth system model. And um, as the vegetation is, de depends on the fertilization of the CO2, we use the CO2 from the recent um, analysis from Peter Köhler, and yes, we have the orbital forcing. So always um, 1,000 year uh, runs on, of simulation. Which uh, and we just took the f first 800 years as a spin-up. So then vegetation and carbon pools are filled up, and then we have the last 200 years. And there's already the the big disadvantage here because climate is always not in equilibrium, especially the carbon cycle isn't. But uh, well, that's now the the only way how to do it to get all these data. So how does it look like just for present-day climate as an rough estimate what you see here uh, or pre-industrial climate? You see the coverage by uh, shrubs, trees. Um, and well, the sum of both is the woody type and the grass fraction. So the bold part of the simulation shows us here for our pre-industrial climate um, the grass, and uh, the woody part is mainly dominated by, by shrubs, and uh, it looks reasonable, especially if we look in the burned area. So we come up up to 90 mega hectares burning in, in that domain, and if you compare it to satellite observations, it's in the good range of these. Well, they have their uncertainties, but. Um, and partly they disagree, but uh, well, at least the model is within this range. So we thought, okay, it's very trustable to, to take this approach. And grass is, yeah, the bold part of burning here, 71 uh, mega hectares. Um, now the data from NLAW, um, and please be careful, now time is running from left to right, all the time long. I will never change it again. Um, and. Uh, here are the data as the elongation ratio and the charcoal records filtered for these time periods where we, of what we do have. So in, in the beginning for the first, let's say, 50, 60,000 years, we have each 4,000 years simulations. And afterwards, it comes to really each 1,000 years, there are simulations for um, at least the last um, 20,000 years. And I hope you can, can see it. Um, so that's just as, as climate um, um, or the, let's say here temperature over that area as an annual mean over that area as an average. And what you do see is the um, pinkish curve on top of this red one, dash one, which is the maximum temperature. So the maximum in one of these 100, uh, 200 years we analyzed. Um, the red one is the, the big red one is the um, average and the orange one is the minimum. So what you do is see we have a slight decline of the temperature until let's say 20K and then there's an increase again. Um, and on the back you see always these curves from the charcoal and the elongation ratio out of the core. So um, for sure what you can see here by bigger matching, um, perhaps the extreme temperature sort of, at least in the beginning, might correlate, let's say, uh, with the charcoal, but uh, that's really 
not really that much. If you go to precipitation, and you see the, the average big line in the middle, uh, it stays almost constant for that area. What you see is that you have a lot of high peaks, especially at, let's say, during the Holocene. And here the uh, uh, correlation seems, or well, just wiggle matching. I have never calculated a correlation because therefore the curve doesn't really fit good enough. Um, so if you, if you look here, uh, then you see that uh, at least for the maximum precipitation sort of peaks with the uh, peaks in, the, in, in charcoal and perhaps just for the, let's say, first 40,000 years, but in the, uh, so let's say from 120 to 80,000 years, but in between it doesn't really fit at all. What you can see is, um, at the end, so when our fire decreases, so the dash gray line goes down, we have a lot of high precipitation events, so this might be the reason to, to reduce the fire activity because we have a lot of um, um, high precipitation um, values there. So, And uh, now we go to the burned area, which is simulated now here by the model. Um, that looks everything else than what we got out of the core. So if you look for the mean value, which is the blue line on the bottom, that's almost one mega hectare burning per grid box. So we have some 100 grid boxes, that's, so that's why we come up to this about 90 mega hectares at total. Um, there's almost no variability inside in this mean. But if you look, for example, the standard deviation or the standard deviation divided by the mean value is as high as the mean value. So there's a lot of variability inside. And if you look in the maximum, that's four times higher than the average. So there's a lot of spatial variability in fire activity over that area. And uh, if we look in the carbon emissions, it's the same what we can say here again. The average is, let's say, um, a little bit more flat, but we get some variability at least by the grass. So shrubs and trees have a more or less constant signal for the carbon emissions by fire, but uh, um, the grass seems to be the, the player who triggers at least some variability what we get out of the core. And if we uh, look in the cover fractions, um, again here over time how these things are changing, then uh, we do see that uh, the dark green, which are the trees, and the light green, which are the shrubs, is not changing in the model that much. And uh, so let's go on the standard deviation as a spatial distribution or a spatial variability over that area. And what we do see here is that uh, shrubs and grass, they yeah, have the same variability, and these both are the one changing their, uh, their, their fractionation, how they cover the, the area, and this starts to um, come up or to, to, to degree at least for the first 40,000 years in, uh, in the area. And uh, finally, we look just at the maximum width of burned area, so we took from these 200 years always from the last time, the, the maximum, and here just for maximum of grass. And uh, in the, uh, it should be this. And what you do see here is that at least we have an, an increase in the beginning, and then we have a decrease, and it increases again, and there's a dip. So um, we thought of, okay, let's let's try to understand this, this these, um, these system and look in spatial variability because we have what we do think what we do have here is an interaction at least of climate and vegetation and it's um, um, not just that easy that the full area at least is reported as fire in that core and here the, the same plot as before just as an uh, anomaly um, so well in the beginning we have this small increase then there's a decrease and it's increasing again um, I should have mentioned that I never looked in the amplitude of these uh, peaks, so because we do not really know how much is really transported into the core, so at least if we have the, the timing right, that there is a peak, then we could perhaps have a good reason, but uh, um, perhaps the, the transport is again uh, different. So, um, and uh, well, this plot looks a little bit busy, but it uh, it's not as it looked like, perhaps. Um, so time is uh, from left to right, from 120K to 104K, so just the first 20,000 years. And you have always a four panels, which is uh, the same arranged as the woody type, vegetation top left, then the trees, shrubs, and grass below. And what I would like just to show you is that uh, these are anomaly plots, so what is changing over the 
time mean in that area is that from left to right, so with time, what you do see is grass pops up, shrubs are removed, and also if you look in the, in the tree cover, comes up here at 112, 108K, um, and um, then afterwards they decrease again. And if we now look in the fire, it's the same here. So we have bluish and reddish colors. Bluish means that we have uh, uh, reduced, and the reddish is more fire activity. And what you do see again, so in the bottom line, it's getting more and more reddish. Um, and that's due to the fact that we have here much more grass burning. So this, this pattern is close to the total overall pattern. So, and uh, compared to the, to the error ridge, so once we started with, um, let's say, 13 mega hectare below average, and then it, we have this dip I showed in the beginning to up to 33 mega hectares burning, and afterwards it increases. So what you do see here, even this, this thing is so, so reddish, you think, okay, there should be more fire activity, we should be above the average, but it's always compensated here by the um, less burned area by, uh, by the trees. And afterwards, what you see again, so the amount of uh, fire activity here in, for the grass seems to be constant, um, but uh, if you, perhaps the scale is a little bit difficult to see, but it does matter now. Um, again, we have an uh, increase in, in fire activity, and um, so overall of that area. And this correlates also to the elongation ratio, what we do have, because what we do so in the elongation ratio, so the, the um, the, the, rel the relative change of grass fire to, to woody fire, um, this correlates with the, um, uh, is similar to the behavior here of more or less fire due to uh, shrubs or grass. So at least there's something on process what we, what we can understand, but uh, at least the, the peak is not correct, so it's not on, on the same amount what we expect. And uh, therefore, we have a lot of open questions, and uh, so we are not take home messages, but more take home questions and, uh, and some conclusions. So, um, first, it's not as simple as it looked like in the beginning. We just thought, okay, we, we have a model that is really able to capture fire activity, so let's compare it. Um, and the variability in climate and vegetation has really. Um, it, um, is this variability is not as high as it is recorded in this uh, in the in the core. So the model doesn't really get this variability right. It might be due to this setting of the model. Um, there are underlying changes in the vegetation and uh, um, climate seems to be the driver for for these trends. Of, although with both they are coupled, and most likely the extreme fire events are just the one that are really reported in the in the core. And then we can think about perhaps just one area of the of that domain is really reported in that core. So if it's just perhaps some extreme fires and just one part of this area, and then we have, over the long time frame, we have a lot of changes in circulation patterns and uh, deglaciation, for example, LGM is, is everything else as well simulated by the model, so perhaps that's a good reason to don't get it. But um, yeah, so I guess we, we do have at least still a starting point to understand what's happening in that area. And um, yeah, the questions are, is the signal we do see in the core really an integrated signal over the area I showed, or just a part? And uh, are these changes just extremes? And which extremes? And uh, uh, what is about the background fire activity we do not see in the, uh, here in the model right now? So, and perhaps the model setup is not valid, because by the model setup, what we used is we have a constant um, variability because we put on an anomaly to an existing climate of pre-industrial climate and if we assume have long uh, big changes over the last glacial cycle variability and uh, extremes could not be as linear as we put it in the model setup so um, perhaps we have to rework on that as again and but I hope we, we are on a good point to start with okay that's it and uh, yeah, have to take questions uh, good afternoon, everyone. So I'm going to stick with the Southern Hemisphere today and talk about uh, fire in the rainforest in Tasmania. So a quick introduction to what the forests I'm going to be talking about today. They were once a dominant part of the Australian continent, um, and after 30 million years ago when Australia split from Antarctica and the climate changed from a perennially wet climate to a more arid and seasonal 
climate, uh, these rainforests suffered a huge range contraction. Alongside this uh, change in aridity came an increase in fire and a proliferation of eucalyptus species, which by 20 million years ago were widespread across the Australian continent. So I'm going to talk about uh, Tasmania today, which is where the largest vestiges of this cool temperate rainforest survive in Australia. Um, the western coast of Tasmania is ideally suited for cool temperate rainforest. As you can see, it receives a high amount of rainfall brought off the southern ocean by the southwesterly winds. Uh, and the rainfall is deposited along the west coast as it comes up over the north-south trending mountain range, with some areas receiving up to three metres of rainfall a year. But what you can see if you look at this picture is that although this region is ideally suited for cool temperate rainforest, what we actually get is these cool temperate rainforest tracks shown in blue interspersed with button grass moorland shown in the orange and wet eucalyptus forest shown in that sort of darker green. Now, the reason for this has been attributed to uh, the application of fire by Indigenous people during the Holocene, which caused the range contraction of rainforest and the expansion of button grass moorland. So here's some fires, uh, some images that we can see. These cool temperate rainforests have also suffered even greater range contraction since European settlement, with large wildfires in 1934, resulting in the huge destruction of large tracts of uh, cool temperate rainforest, and again in 1965. So at the top, these uh, dead trees that you can see are all Athrotaxis stags. So they're one of the dominant cool temperate rainforest species in Tasmania uh, from the Cupressaceae family. And again, in this picture down here, these stags are all cool temperate rainforest trees. And what we've seen from these fires, even in 1934, is very limited or no recovery of these systems. And these, these trees um, grow for thousands of years and it means the dynamics of these systems are in the order of centuries to millennia, which means that traditional ecological methods are not suitable to understand the full range of dynamics and the response of these systems to fire. So the, this is some work that I did in my masters um, on Lake Perry, situated here. And this site, Lake Osborne, had been worked on previously by Fletcher et al. in 2014. And these two sites provided us the chance to look at fine-scale topographic variations in fire and rainforest dynamics through the Holocene. So as you can see, these two sites are located in southwest Tasmania, right on the border between that rainforest and wet sclerophyll eucalyptus forest. And the rainfall, the climate of the region is still, again, ideally suited for cool temperate rainforest with precipitation exceeding evaporation through, during the year. So when we look at the two uh, sites a bit more closely, you can see that they both have similar sized catchments. Um, they've both got this steep headwall, um, northeast facing headwall, which is exposed to greater radi uh, solar radiation and increased fire fanning winds that in Tasmania generally come from the north. Um, so you can see that both catchments are generally north to easterly facing um, with small pockets of south facing on this other side. And this just shows the steep slopes that are highlighted in the topographic diagram. So these are the two age models for the sites. I won't dwell on these very much, but there's uh, 21 radiocarbon dates from the Lake Perry age depth model. Um, we did have a few issues with this site. Uh, the top section of the core returned a lot of um, erroneously old ages, so we thought. So we dated the very top of the sediment and returned a radiocarbon age of 1450. So we then used that and a paired bulk sediment and macrofossil sample that we had further down the core to apply an age correction uh, to the model. And this is the Lake Osborne uh, age depth model, which is based on 11 radiocarbon dates. So here's some data from the two sites, um, moving from oldest to youngest, right to left. Um, we've got Lake Perry on this side and Lake Osborne on this side. So we've got macroscopic charcoal from both sites fitted with a generalised additive model on the bottom. Nothophagus gunnii, one of the dominant uh, cool temperate rainforest, montane cool temperate rainforest species. Uh, Cupressaceae species, which includes those Athrotaxis species that uh, you saw the stags of earlier. And Sclerophyllus taxa, which includes eucalyptus species. So as you can see, in the early um, deglacial and Holocene, the two sites show relatively low fire frequency um, and dominance of this cool temperate rainforest species, uh, Nothophagus gunnii. And then as we move into the mid-Holocene, we see a much greater increase in fire activity. Uh, and this fire activity has a negative response on the rainforest taxa, 
causing the local decline, uh, extinction, I guess, of Nocophagus gunnii at uh, Lake Perry, and then at 6,000 years after a second fire, causing the localised extinction of Nocophagus gunnii at Lake Osborne. Um, what you can see, though, is that this rainforest, these rainforest species here, whilst being negatively impacted by fire, uh, also are able to recover from fire. And up the top, you see the Sclerophyllus taxa, which at Lake Perry remains very low throughout the entire Holocene, whereas at Lake Osborne begins to increase after 6,000 years and really increases after three. Now, in the last part of the record, the, the two records seem to diverge and the response to fire becomes different. And at this point, the rainforest is able to recover at Lake Perry, but yet at Lake Osborne, we see no recovery even after 3,000 years of relatively low fire. But what we do see at Lake Osborne is an increase in sclerophylla species, primarily eucalyptus. So if we look at this data um, in a detrended correspondence analysis of the biplot, you can see that... Uh, Sorry. In the, where's my button gone? In the early uh, deglacial here, you see that the samples, the two sites, um, Lake Osborne's shown in blue and Lake Perry shown in green, that the two sites are very similar, clustered together. And again, coming into the Holocene um, from 12 to 6, the two sites are both sitting sa within that same community composition in the ordination space. But then once we hit 6,000 years, the two sites begin to diverge, with Lake Perry staying clustered in this kind of rainforest zone whilst Lake Osborne moves out along axis one, which is most highly correlated with eucalyptus species. So if we plot the scores from the DCA axis one, again fitted with a generalised additive model, you see that for the first 6,000 years, um, the two sites are very well coupled um, and they show much similarity. But then after 6,000 years marked here, the two sites begin to diverge. So if we look at some frequency distribution plots of the uh, DCA axis one scores, see in this early part of the record that the two sites overlap very heavily, and we've interpreted this to mean that it's got a single resilient attractor, that the state of these forests is quite stable and both quite similar. But then as we move through to this next section from 3,000 3, to 6,000 years, the two sites begin to diverge, and you see a separation of the pollen or vegetation composition of the two sites, and we think that this is the emergence of an alternate uh, attractor or an alternate stable state. And then as you move into the late Holocene, you see a complete divergence of the two vegetation communities. And with Lake Osborne sitting here and Lake Perry sitting here, and we're indicating that that is uh, the actual establishment of an alternate stable state because Lake Perry, uh, Lake Osborne sorry, has shown no recovery from this other uh, state that it's now come into. So we can see this again. Oh, sorry, I should mention that... Um, We've uh, determined that the emergence of this alternate stable state was driven by the frequency of fire uh, and that then the tipping point, the switch between the alternate stable state, occurred due to the presence of eucalyptus species. Because as we can see here, uh, the cumulative number of fires is actually higher at Lake Perry. But Lake Osborne is the site that switches to the alternate stable state. So without the presence of eucalyptus, Lake Perry's been able to stay within this stable rainforest state, whilst Lake Osborne has switched to this pyrophilic uh, eucalyptus, uh, highly flammable kind of vegetation community. So we've sort of been trying to work out why this might be the case. Um, as you remember, both the sites had very similar topographies, um, very similar catchment sizes, all of that. So both would be uh, exposed to fire in the same way um, and exposed to eucalyptus colonisation probably in the same way as well. Both sites have um, sorry, similar percentage of south-facing slopes. Again, Lake Perry has a greater percentage of southwesterly facing slopes, which might provide a slightly greater uh, protection from fire than uh, the southeasterly slopes of Lake Osborne. But then if we look at this uh, spatially, what we see is that the Lake Perry south-facing slopes are all clustered together. And what we've got here in the light green are um, areas of edge effect where the rainforest would be exposed to greater radiation um, and perhaps more encroachment of fire. And in the darker green, these core areas of rainforest that would be slightly protected by the outer layers of rainforest. Whereas at Lake Osborne over here, we have no levels, no layers of core rainforest that would provide any protection from incoming fires. So we're thinking that maybe this could be uh, a reason for an increase in uh, resilience between uh, the, two, the two sites and maybe providing Lake Perry some added protection um, from fire. 
So I guess in summary, what we've discovered from this work is that um, recurrent fires erode the resilience of montane cool temperate rainforest, but they are still a part of this system. Even though they're highly fire sensitive, fires have occurred periodically throughout the Holocene, yet this rainforest has been able to survive. The presence of eucalyptus seems to provide the tipping point uh, at which these rainforest uh, systems switch to an alternate stable state, a more flammable, drier vegetation community. Um, and again, that montane cool temperate rainforest, these species can recover from fire, given a sufficient fire-free interval within you know, the realm of hundreds of years uh, and in the absence of eucalyptus species. And that perhaps topographic variation may provide fire protected refugia where these montane rainforests can survive and persist into the future. So there might be a chance that they will survive. And I'd just like to thank my collaborators and open any questions. What, what is the eucalyptus doing? Is it competition or is it its fire colonies? I think it's probably competition and change, potentially changing the uh, microclimate of the region. So these rainforests are quite humid and dense, and so it does make it very hard for fire and other species uh, to colonise. But the eucalyptus um, creates a more open canopy, canopy, and there seems to be a lot more sort of shrubby type um, community going on. What I probably should have mentioned was that the part of the reason we decided to do this study was because Lake Osborne is currently surrounded by uh, sclerophyllous vegetation, eucalyptus species. But Lake Perry is as well, except that at Lake Perry you see a few of these, uh, this is one of those Athotaxis trees, a cupressaceae, um, clinging to the lake shore and some of the old dead trees um, within the catchment. So we were wondering why there was such a difference between the vegetation communities. But yeah, I think it's probably got to do with the opening of the catchment um, and changing of the microclimate and maybe changing the fire frequency that we're not seeing. We might be seeing it in the smaller, finer fraction, the micro charcoal, rather than the macro charcoal. Your, your implication is that the, um, there's very little or almost no regeneration of the pencil pine. No. Um, as far as we know, there has been very little or none from the fires that have occurred since European settlement. Um, and as you could potentially see from the diagrams, it was taking you know, hundreds of years, up to 600 years, for these forests to recover um, from fire events. So any type of management that we're talking about at the moment might not be a long enough fire-free interval. Thank you very much. My name is Angie, and I hope it's fine for me to stand over here a little bit sliding, because apparently the podium is made from human and not for hobbit. So, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Yeah, uh, I would like to share part of my PhD work on a tropical peatland in Indonesia. Well, um, tropical peatland play an important role in the global carbon cycle by storing one-fifth of the total global peat carbon pool. And this ecosystem, which are mainly located in Indonesia and Malaysia, are currently suffer from rapid land use change and conversion. For example, between 2000 and 2010 alone, Indonesia has lost over 2 million hectares of its peat cover. And this situation, without no doubt, needs an effective conservation or management strategies. But nowadays, in our human-dominated world, conservation or management strategies needs also to consider human as a part of the ecosystem. And this can actually be improved by adding historical perspective, particularly on the past interaction between human and peatland in the past. Um, unfortunately, uh, such information is very much lacking, particularly in the tropical area. Therefore, we conducted our study in Sungai Bulu peatland in Indonesia, aiming to improve our understanding on this interaction between human and peatland in the past. Sungai Bulu peatland itself was selected as our study site due to its vicinity to an ancient remains of Malayu Empire called Muara Jambi Temple. Mali Empire was one of the largest kingdom in Indonesian history, and it was very famous as a pepper center in the past. And Muara Jambi Temple complex itself was built in the 9th century, and it acted as the capital of the empire. This temple complex was later abandoned in the 14th century, following the demise of the empire due to the conquest from other kingdom. And according to a previous paleological study, um, Sungai Bulu peatland was initiated in around 13,000 years ago, and it developed from a topogenous phase dominated by mixed riparian forests to an umbrogenous phase dominated by peat swamp forests in around 1,200 core UBP. 
And in this study, we would like to answer some specific questions, such as whether or not that the uh, people of Malay Empire conducted any activities on Sungai Buloh peatland, and if they did, what kind of activities did they conduct, and how those activities impact the peatland, or maybe its function as well. And we will also like to know how the peatland responded back to such a disturbance. And to answer those questions, we compare the environmental condition of Sungai Bulu peatland derived from paleontological study between the pre, uh, where is it? Between the pre, during, and post occupation period of Malay Empire in the vicinity of Sungai Bulu peatland. And we also assess the dynamic of past uh, carbon accumulation rate as well as its past fire regime. And the results suggest that before the occupation period of uh, Malay Empire in the vicinity of the peatland, the forest cover of Sungai Bulu peatland was still dense, as suggested by the domination of tree shirt pollen proportion in the diagram. However, soon after the arrival of the empire, the proportion of tree shirt pollen decreased, which was suggesting that there was a reduction in forest cover. And this is accompanied by the increased pollen proportion of herbaceous taxa, oh, herbaceous taxa and bushes such as Pibrasi, Ardesia, Fosse, and Groidae. Well, according to historical information, the people of Malaya Empire has utilized the available abundance natural resources such as woods and other vegetal material, probably palm leaves or rattan, uh, to construct their houses. Therefore, it is likely that the reduction of forest cover in Sungai Bulu was related to logging or timber harvesting activities. And it was also mentioned in this study that the people of Malay Empire was not an egalitarian society, which means that there was needs to show their social status by um, constructing elite wooden houses, uh, which are larger in dimension and using bigger and more detailed ornamentation. And this could also lead to the increase of natural resource exploitation. Meanwhile, Ardesia is a kind of plant that commonly found in the disturbed area, and it also reported to grow vigorously on the grazing ground um, due to the high alkaloid content on their leaves, which is uh, giving a bitter taste and at some point can also be toxic. This plant is unpalatable. So whenever the other grasses and herbaceous are grazed, um, they uh, sorry, the competition for resources reduce and it enhances the uh, growth of Ardesia. Therefore, the uh, abundance of Ardesia in the record suggests that the people of Malay Empire also conducted grazing activities on the peatland. And considering that Malay Empire was a renowned pepper center in the past, it is feasible that the people of Malay Empire benefited from the increase of pepper assay by conducting wild harvesting activities. Interestingly, we couldn't find any cerealia pollen in the diagram, which suggests that the people did not utilize the peatland uh, to, for agricultural use. What is that? Oh, no. <laughs> and, um, uh, the past fire regime of Sungai Buru also doesn't show any significant increase in uh, charcoal abundance nor uh, fire frequency during the occupation period of Malay Empire, which suggesting that the people uh, did not extensively use fire to support their activities on the peatland. And when we take a look to the carbon accumulation rate of Sungai Buru, there is a decreased average rate during the occupation period of Malay Empire which was likely related to the decreased um, net primary productivity owing to the reduction in forest cover and also the accumulation of more decomposable organic material or in this case herbaceous leaves. And following the um, abandonment of the site after the demise of the empire, the uh, pollen proportion of tree shrub increased which suggests a increase in forest cover or forest regeneration and to assess whether the forest decomposition of Sungai Buru returned to its previous condition, a um, PC analysis was applied on the pollen and spore data in Sungai Buru. And the results suggest that Sungai Buru forest, which uh, developed into a peat swamp forest in around 1200 Koi EPP, did recover after uh, around 150 years after the abandonment of the site. And following the recovery of the forest, the average carbon accumulation rate of Sungai Bulu also increased um, 
which was likely related to the uh, enhanced um, net primary productivity following the increase in forest cover, and also the accumulation of lignin-rich organic material, which are more difficult to decompose, such as roots, stems, branches, or barks. So from this results, we can conclude that humans started their activities on tropical peatlands already since around a millennium ago by conducting logging, grazing, and timber harvesting, activity, wild harvesting activities, sorry. And um, these activities have impacted the peatland by changing its vegetation composition and also diminished the ecosystem capacity to store carbon. Nevertheless, uh, peatland can be resilient to human disturbance. Both floristic composition and the ecosystem function of the peatland might recover once the disturbance ceased. And in Songobul case, the recovery process took around 150 years. It was also shown by the result that socioeconomic and political conditions such as social status, livelihood, and war can also indirectly impact the peatland and its function. So um, this record actually got me wonder um, what can we actually learn from the past and what the messages really are. So, well, I think the first is that there is hope for any existing or prospective peatland restoration or conservation projects. And um, I think we can also create a peatland wise use strategies by copying or imitating the type and the degree of past human disturbance which are proven to be reversible or sort of resilience friendly. And the recovery time of Sungabulu peatland can also um, hint the uh, appropriate uh, period allocation for a, any existing or prospective peatland restoration or conservation project. And it also advises to reconsider or to extend the allocated period of some existing projects which are unlikely to be sufficient. And um, it was also shown that there are many different factors that can directly and indirectly impact the peatland and its function. So, uh, to reach peatland sustainability or any kind of ecosystem, it is important to emerge or integrate many different perspectives so that I can provide the required information in both spatially and temporally. So basically, um, it is resounding the statement from Catherine Willis in her paper in 2007. It's time to talk. Thank you. This has been a great session so far, and I, I'm really, I'm really happy uh, to have seen some of the other presentations, which are going to give you some nice uh, background or hopefully insight into what I'm going to show you today. This is, uh, this is, this is probably new to you. This is also really new to me. I uh, just recently started a new, a new project to look at the way in which the Maori transformed the landscapes of New Zealand prior to European arrival and following their colonization. So uh, first of all, I really need to acknowledge uh, the people who give me the resources and help to, to do this project. So thank you, to, thank you to them and to those funding agencies. OK, what about New Zealand? What do we know about, about the ecological history of New Zealand? Well, we suspect anyway, from pollen, mainly from pollen-based uh, reconstructions of land cover, that New Zealand was largely forested prior to the time of the Maori arrival, which was in the early part of the second millennium AD. OK, and so we have a map that looks like this. And you could, you, it says 81,000, but it could be sort of any time in the mid to late Holocene, where you have uh, New Zealand largely covered by forest. You have some sort of um, en endemic grasslands in the south, middle part of the South Island, sort of the driest of the dry valleys uh, to the, in the central part, um, and some very tiny areas of shrubland that you almost can't see at all. Okay, but then what happens after the Maori arrive? Well, um, the, it, the sort of reconstruction, which is now, this is quite actually based on quite old data, but I think that it's be largely supported by newer uh, analyses is that, re that before Europeans arrived, or when Europeans first arrived uh, in New Zealand, it already looked like this. So we're talking about a very substantial deforestation of this landscape, and that is also sort of borne out by what we see, for example, in charcoal records, these, these from the South Island, data from David McWethy. Most of these sites are actually in the mountains, interestingly, so not necessarily in the area where we expect the largest deforestation to have occurred. Nevertheless, um, 
The conclusion of this study and also another, another study that looked at pollen was that just uh, post the arrival of the Maori in New Zealand, there was a large deforestation and fire, a, a large fire event or series of events that is associated also with deforestation. So there is this interesting question then about New Zealand is, okay, the Maori arrived probably around 1280 AD, um, and, and were they then responsible for this kind of very large scale deforestation? Could they have done it? People ask me this all the time when I do my fire modeling. How could those people burn down all those trees? You know, how could so few people burn down so many trees? Well, actually, it's not that hard. I think that we are, um, I think that we are sort of biased by our contemporary um, experience with fire. But uh, humans in the pre-industrial world were very tuned to the power of fire that they could use to manage the landscape. So in order to sort of address these questions, um, for those of you who know me, we, we uh, do some modeling because that's what I like, that's what I like to do. And so uh, we actually have this wonderful fire model now called LPJ LM Fire. And effectively, here's, here's the very simple flow chart. I don't have time to go into more of it, but you can ask me afterwards. Um, we have a model that uh, very importantly here takes into account human ignition, so therefore managed wildfire, okay? And and one of the things then that we have in this model is a representation of the way that people used fire in the past. And effectively, in our model, we recognize that different types of livelihoods, different types of um, different types of subsistence systems uh, real related with fire in different ways. And so here we have um, hunter, we separate effectively people into hunter-gatherers, pastoralists, and farmers. For the case of uh, Maori New Zealand, we're effectively talking about hunter-gatherers. It's true that the Maori were an agricultural society before they arrived in New Zealand, but interestingly, the crops that they developed or um, evolved their livelihood system with from in the tropics is not, were not very successful in New Zealand because the climate is not really amenable to that. So when they get to especially the South Island, they actually kind of they kind of revert to a more sort of forager or horticulturist type of subsistence livelihood as opposed to a um, as opposed to farming. Okay, so they're hunting gathering, and we can represent that in the model. And the model represents the way hunter gatherers use fire to manage a landscape with equations. I'm not going to really take you through this. Effectively, the point is that humans like heterogeneous, diverse landscapes. Why? Okay, because we have here a kind of um, very simple model that's based on the based on the ideas of the famous uh, anthropologist Lewis Binford, which is basically that people like kind of landscapes, hunter gatherers or forager horticulturists like to live in landscapes of intermediate productivity and was kind of a heterogeneous, a big variety of different types of landscapes. No more time to go into that right now. Suffice it to say that we have the sort of greatest carrying capacity for um, our Maori at sort of intermediate levels of forest cover. So diverse landscapes. Okay, so we now we're going to use the LPJ LM fire now and now in version 1.3. We're going to make a 1,000 year simulation where we introduce the Maori 800 years since we allow a kind of stable equilibrium vegetation to develop, and then we then we just put the Maori on the landscape. And there, there's no sort of diffusion process here. Actually, archaeologists suggest that the colonization was relatively rapid. And New Zealand isn't that big. So once people landed there, they could actually move quite quickly across, um, across the landscape. And you find archaeological sites are really contemporaneous across the entire landscape. Um, to do the entire uh, uh, area of, of New Zealand is about 250,000 um, grid cells, in the, in which is a computational challenge for, for LPJ. So um, I'll show you what we did in a second. We have special climate data that we got from, from NIWA, from the local authorities in New Zealand, and we're using a lightning data set that's kind of new and very exciting. Um, and talk about that later. Okay, one final point to make here is we have not made any special parameterization for New Zealand plants. New Zealand does have a unique flora, and LPJ was effectively developed um, kind of with a northern hemisphere bias. So you are seeing here um, only one major change, and that is that there's no temperate deciduous trees, that all the trees are evergreen. Okay, so here's our study area, all of New Zealand. This is a kind of topo map, and this is at one kilometer. One thing that you should notice here, perhaps, is just how complex the landscape of New Zealand is. There's a big, there's big mountain range that goes along the entire South Island, and it was one of the reasons why we wanted to run this at one kilometer resolution, because we're really trying to understand what's going on in a relatively small area, and I believe that spatial resolution is important. So for right now, what I've done is I've just taken a subset, which is the northern half of the eastern part of the South Island. This 
this is um, Canterbury and the, um, and the region to the north of that, uh, at Marlborough maybe, okay. Um, and, and effectively this is the area where we think that the Maori probably had the greatest impact on the vegetation. So here we are now um, with the results. Um, and this is, this is pretty exciting, okay. Everyone hold on to your chair. Because I'm just, uh, you know, okay, and so this is, this is, this is it. Um, you're seeing the result, these results for the first time, and so am I. Okay, so um, <laughs> I'm going to play, I'm going to play a movie here, okay, and this movie is effectively going to, going to start out 30 years, unfortunately the top of the map is cut off, but, but the top of the time series is cut off here, but so we're going to start 30 years prior to the arrival of the Maori, so it's the last 30 years of this kind of 800 year long model spin up. And then we're gonna introduce the Maori, bam, you know, you're gonna show up. Um, and then we're gonna run it for another 100 years. So you can see what happens to the vegetation, which is the left um, map here. So it's a tree cover. And the right is the fire, is the burned area effectively. So every pixel, so white means no burned area, more red means that more of the larger fraction of the grid cell is being burned. Okay, so we'll let that play, and here it goes, and nothing's happening very much until the Maori arrive, and then all of a sudden you get um, a big sort of deforestation event related to increase in fire. But what's, what is interesting here um, is that it seems, it seems to kind of go back to some kind of forested state after a while. So, th so this, is, this is a really, really kind of um, interesting phenomenon that's occurring here. There's this initial sort of fire-led deforestation, but the Maori don't seem to be able to cause a kind of permanent um, deforestation of the landscape, at least not at the kind of scale that we sort of expect from the, say, pollen-based reconstruction. So I'll come back to that in a second, but just to show you how that looks in a time series. So here we have um, Maori population density. So there's people arrive and their populations grow. That's associated with a decline in forest cover and, uh, and an increase in burned area. These are the kind of things that we could compare to the paleo data effectively. So to charcoal or pollen, haven't quite done that yet. So I said, I said when I showed the animation, they kind of caught, managed to cause this fire and cause an initial deforestation, but then this forest him somehow kind of recovers over time. One thing I didn't mention is that right in these in this experiments, I am not doing any kind of paleoclimate scenario, okay? So right, right here, I just have um, a long-term climatological mean climate with interannual variability superimposed on it. This is the similar process to what Tim described in his, in his analysis, but there's no sort of long-term um, low frequency trend in climate. But actually we know that there really was some low frequency um, changes in climate in New Zealand around the time of the Maori arrival. This now from a r r fairly old paper by Ed Cook, uh, temperature reconstruction for, uh, for New Zealand using, um, based on tree rings. And we do see that interestingly, sort of just prior to, um, just prior to the, what we think is a Maori arrival, there is a sort of warmer period. Okay, so perhaps, and I already, I already sort of suspected this might be true when I wrote my abstract, if you remember it, I know you all read it, um, <laughs> the, that, that it was not enough to just put people on the landscape of New Zealand, but it also requires some kind of secular climate change, some low frequency climate variability. So perhaps the temperature, it could also be related to hydroclimate, and we actually, there is a, a drought atlas um, thanks to Ed Cook and colleagues um, for, for New Zealand and, and part of Australia. Um, these data at the moment don't, are not published to go back to the Maori arrival time, but I was talking to Ed and I think we can probably push them back further. So um, fire is rare, natural fire is extremely rare in the South Island of New Zealand. Okay, the, there's hardly an, ever any lightning. Interestingly, there is fire weather pretty much every year, but uh, there's just no, there's just almost never any lightning. This is this is um, not so unusual for 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 those of you who might might think think that that's unusual. But actually, there are plenty of parts of the world where it's where it's common that we have very strongly ignition limited systems. Um, so you read that. So people come and they open up the forest, but uh, it seems to be temporary. So I think that perhaps the real deforestation of New Zealand requires some kind of perfect storm of human action combined with climate change, but then possibly also changes in species composition or vegetation structure. And coming back to Heidi's talk, 
about on Tasmania. I think we have very similar thing happening here in New Zealand where we have a shift from one type of um, pyrophobic vegetation, if you want, to pyrophilic vegetation, and that may be sort of self-reinforcing. We, we can capture some of that in LPJ using, um, you, with, with grass, but, but there's probably also shrubs that we're missing. So that's it. Uh, here you can just see the result one more time, and thanks very much for your attention. The warm lump in Ed's reconstruction could be an ecological response to the clearing of the woodlands. You know, he's got a bias in his reconstruction. You know, he's got gap opening from fire or removal of forest, and they've sampled the remaining trees, and they have a canopy opening. It's an interesting idea. It, but it, but, it, but as, it, as, I said, as I noted on the thing, it seems to be that the biggest peak comes before what we think was the first Maori, um, the, the arrival of the Maori. Oh. So they come in at 1280, and the sort of first major peak in his in the in the warm in the warm uh, period is around is around uh, what is that about 1150 or something like that. So unless people arrive earlier, plus I I suspect this is mainly based on high elevation trees, and we would expect that the Maori impact, as we showed in the model, is greatest at the low elevations rather than the high elevation. You, you've run the model in, in drier regions of, of New Zealand. Um, what would happen if you, or have you tried running them in more humid areas to the north and to the west? Yeah, uh, I suspect it would become, well, I, d I haven't run it yet, so what you've seen is, is, is to kind of last them few weeks worth of work. We've got all the data, data together to do the whole of New Zealand, so I think we'll get there in the next few weeks, but um, it's, uh, I, I suspect it will become more difficult. So experience has shown from modeling studies, global modeling studies with the same model, that in the humid tropics, for example, um, humans are just simply not able to change the, change the forest cover, and so they kind of give up. They just stop burning after a while. That's the way the model works. So you, you're using still nor northern hemisphere plant functional types, so is it perhaps that you're not capturing the characteristics of the southern hemisphere nothophagus? Yeah, show, absolutely. I, I, you know, I which alluded are to very that. insensitive to fire. So it may be that people burned, and they. I mean, the thinking is that they didn't. Those those species just couldn't right. regenerate. Yeah, just as we just as we heard in Tasmania, I right. think there's a very similar dynamic going on in New Zealand, and uh, and actually after I made these first simulations, you know, just to just. Just to be honest with everybody, you know, I actually realize I don't know anything about the vegetation of New Zealand. So <laughs> I, I will solicit some help in the next few in the next few months to get better handle on that. Well, do you have any post fire response in your model? I mean, in yeah. So I mean, in in, 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 in the sense that if if there is a big enough deforestation, so we have a different parameterization of the way fire burns in in forest or in trees versus grassland, mm -hmm. and there is. LPJL and fire is able to capture this kind of self-reinforcing effect. As you go towards more herbaceous vegetation, you tend to get more frequent fire, which excludes the regeneration of um, woody plants. And so you, you end up, you can get a regime shift, but I think that what's going on in, in Southern Hemisphere is a little bit more subtle, and we need to reparameterize our vegetation in order to capture that better. Well, thank you all for being here. I just uh, noticed that my title is not the sexiest, and it's right before lunch, so <laughs> thank you again to stay with me. Um, so white fires and geochemical changes is not really clear for everybody. I will mostly uh, talk about nutrients. Um, so just to be clear and speak about the same thing together, a quick overview about what I, was, uh, uh, what I will talk about. Um, so nutrients, there's too many sources atmospheric mostly for carbon and nitrogen, and um, weathered uh, mostly for the others, so basically calcium, uh, phosphorus, potassium, or magnesium, just to cite a few. Uh, they are, of course, essential for plant, uh, so plant survival, plant productivity, plant diversity. Um, and in some system, uh, nitrogen and carbon are also less limiting nutrients uh, since the 20th century due to industrialization, fertilization, and increase of atmospheric CO2. Besides, uh, there's a shift of nutrient limitation in some systems uh, ob already observed to phosphorus or to calcium. Okay, so now if we think about ecosystem functioning and disturbances, um, so wildfires in particular, uh, ecosystem development is just paired with uh, soil sickness and the nutrient cycling will help building a soil uh, with available nutrients to the next generation of plants. This development is ideal and suppose that the system is not experiencing any uh, shifts or dramatic events such as uh, big climate change or disturbances. 
So what we usually call disturbances is a really large amount of things that could happen into the system. Uh, for example, bark beetles, fire, avalanches, ice storms, or amphibolistic activities and pollutions. I will mostly talk about fires today. So now if we think about what could happen to nutrients because of a fire event. So there's two main loss pathways. There's volatilization and erosion. For volatilization, you need to have the temperature reached by a fire event to volatilize your elements. That is mostly the case for carbon and nitrogen. For uh, the other basket ions, uh, the temperature is too high to be reached uh, for a fire event, and so the, the primary loss pathway will be erosion. But on the other hand, um, on the other hand, uh, because of the fire, you will have biomass burning, and then you can have some decomposition in uh, of the vegetation in your system, and then the composition of the vegetation could, uh, in a way, compensate uh, the loss of nutrient by erosion. Okay, so now the site. Uh, I will talk about Chicory Lake. It's a site in the logical pine forest in Colorado mountains. It's a small lake with a small watershed, uh, as you can see here, um, and is uh, currently uh, having an increase in large white fires um, recently. Uh, although uh, there's a stability in the forest associated with fires, which means that the impact of fires, it's not a simple correlation with an increase, meaning a change in the vegetation system. So there's more to understand with that kind of, fi whoop, with that kind of fire um, <laughs> on the vegetation. And uh, on the other hand, the disturbance mediating nutrient availability can definitely decrease the productivity of the system as it always been um, seen in other system, uh, notably New Hampshire. Okay, so this site uh, was previously studied by Phil Igera and Paul Dennett and Kendall McLaughlin, and the sediment was taken off the lake in 2010. Uh, the core was dated with lane 210 and 13 C14 dates. Uh, there's a really amazing edge depth, edge depth uh, model here, practically linear, um, and there's a res resolution time of four years per sample, which is amazing. And so we were really able to see what will happen after and before a fire uh, concerning the nutrients and also the long-term train because we will be able to reconstruct up to 6,000 years of history. Okay, so uh, the first publication by uh, Paul, Phil, and Kendra um, show two different main things. The first thing is that the fire history displays two different types of fire. So there's low severity, extra local fires, and a high severity catchment fires. So basically here, uh, you get a charcoal accumulation rate, and then the blue dots uh, indicate you the low severity fires, and the red dots uh, show you the high severity fires. And what they were able to say is that with high severity fires, there's a um, reduction of organic matter and nitrogen. And they interpreted that as volatilization following the fires because the temperature of the fire was uh, high enough to volatilize uh, carbon and nitrogen. Now the question was, what are the consequences of best cations and uh, how the ecosystem will function with that? Okay, so to assess the nutrient concentrations, I use a uh, handheld XRF. Uh, so with this XRF, we can assess to a lot of different elements. In those elements, we can have some nutrients, we can have some erosion proxies, and we can have pollutants, uh, basically coming from um, human activities as EV metals. I will mostly focus on nutrients and erosion proxies. Okay, so we perform some uh, superposed epoch analysis, and what we can see here, um, so here you have the high severity fire, and here you have the low severity fires. The red line is the moment of the fire, and the blue line is the moment of the fire. So you have before the fire, the fire, after the fire, and then the dashed and, um, sorry, and solid lines uh, are indicating respectively the 90 and 95% confidence interval. So what we can see here is that right after high severity fire events, there's um, an increase uh, of so calcium, potassium, aluminum, phosphorus, and titanium. And because of this increase of titanium, we interpreted that as an increase um, of those elements by a loss of nutrients in the soil by erosion um, a loss pathway. On the other hand, the sulfur is uh, showing an opposite uh, trend with a decrease after the fire event, 
and we interpreted that as a volatilization of pathways. Um, this impact of high solidity fire events are pretty um, uh, short, and after about 30 years after high fire uh, event, uh, there's a recover of the, um, of the concentration of each element as there was before. And finally, the low serity extra local fires have no effect on the elements. Okay, now, um, because we wanted to understand better the element signature of uh, the nutrients into our sediment, we wanted to compare that element concentrations with uh, what is happening in the watershed and how uh, the high severity and low severity fires will be uh, linked to those nutrients. So the first PCA here uh, is showing, um, so the axis one is mostly um, explained by titanium and the elements I showed you before that is increasing after high severity fire events, so magnesium, potassium, calcium, uh, iron, and potassium. And the axis two is mostly explained by sulfur on positive values and silicate on negative values. Okay, so now if you are uh, looking at that, um, so it's the same PCA, uh, but then we plotted the low severity fire event and the high severity fire events as a class um, of samples. And so as you can see, the high severity fire events are mostly on the axis one and mostly on the left uh, side of the PCA. So they are just corresponding to what I showed you before, uh, to those elements. Okay, uh, yeah. The second uh, PCA here is actually the same that this one, uh, except we removed silicate, um, because silicate was not measured for the, the soil compartments. So, um, the axis one is mostly explained by titanium, and the axis two this time is mostly explained by uh, magnesium, manganese, and calcium uh, on the positive values and on the negative values by sulfur. Okay, um, now here are all the um, samples we took uh, on the watershed, and the idea was really to compare what we get in the lake sediments and what we get in the watershed, and how close the lake sediments are reflecting what we can have in the watershed. So um, the idea was to take some uh, vegetation parts, so pine needles, spruce needles, uh, to take the litter component, to take decomposing wood, organic soil, mineral soil, of course, some lake sediment, so subsurface lake sediment, to see if we are uh, close or not with the long-term lake sediment, and uh, some charcoal. So all the gray dots, hope you are seeing all the gray dots, uh, I are my lake uh, samples, and so all the cross and triangle, diamond shape, and etc. are all the watershed uh, samples. So what you can see is that on the axis two, there's mainly uh, vegeta vegetation and litter, and so they are mostly explained by those three elements. And uh, on the axis two, you have mostly the soil and the charcoal. As you can see, there's uh, definitely no link between uh, the lake sediment and the charcoal composition, which is a good sign. Uh, but there's definitely the high severity fire event going up to the mineral soil composition. So given that, uh, we were able to say that the elemental signature of sediment samples are closer to soil origin than plants and also that high severity fires likely eroded the soil up to the mineral horizon. Okay, okay, yeah. So now just a quick um, brainstorm things. Um, so here's the axis one of the PCA and we wanted to have an idea of the long-term trend. So the idea was to just plot the axis one against time. Um, but here the erosion process is on the axis one on the negative part. So more you have negative value, more your erosion. On the other side, more you have positive value, less you have erosion. Okay, now, beam. So here is the axis one, so here's the axis one, here is the time, and so when you are going to negative value, you have more erosion, when you're going to positive value, you have less erosion. And so what we can see on the 6,000, whoops, sorry, on the 6,000 years uh, of history, there's an increase of the values here, which means that there's a decrease of erosion through time. So the long-term trend should decrease our er erosion processes. And we attempted to explain that, and we get uh, three main non-exclusive hypotheses to explain this trend. 
So the first one is that there's, uh, even if there's an increase of the area burned uh, in the recent decades, there's actually a decrease of high serity fire through time, which likely can explain that there's a decrease of the frequency of erosion and the intensity of erosion. There's also a change of, precip of precipitation sorry, through time, and that can be linked to an increase of weathering. So basically, the precipitation balance is coming from more rain to more snow, and the snow is more able to chemically weather the bedrock, and we can think that it can, could have increased the weathering rate and could have increased the nutrient pool in the soil. And finally, the only, <laughs> the only figure I have on vegetation compared to <laughs> all of you so far. Um, so the stability of vegetation um, reconstructed with pollen showed that there's a big resilience of the system, as I explained you before, also shown in the recent decades. And that is probably linked to uh, an increase of the soil depth uh, just because of the establishment of the vegetation, fixation of soils, and so on. So some take home messages. Uh, the nutrient availability is sensitive to high severity fire events, but um, quote unquote only for 30 years. Uh, there's two different love pathways that we were able to highlight it, an erosion processes and a volatilization uh, loss pathway. There's a long-term trend showing a decrease of erosion um, so potentially um, linked to an increase of nutrient availability into the soil. And that is mostly explained by a combined effect of climate, fire regime, and ecosystem development. And finally, the, tra the trajectories of increased high severity fires are likely not to affect the system, uh, mostly because there's a really quick recover and because there's a soil building. Um, just to really finish with um, biogeochemical impacts, I am organizing a workshop uh, pretty soon uh, within the Novice RCN. Um, that will be on disturbances and biogeochemical impacts on vegetation dynamics that will be at Harbour Brook in Yorkshire. Uh, please uh, go to novicerocn.wordpress.com and apply and the deadline June 1st. Thank you, and if you have any questions. I suspect that most of the calcium and, and potassium and phosphorus that you're measuring with the XRF is actually within minerals, yeah, like plagioclase. So that's not that's not those aren't nutrients that are plant available in the soils up in the watershed. Um, so do you have any way of um, looking at the the magnitude of loss of actual available nutrients from the from the watershed or from the yeah from from the soils? Yeah, yeah, it's definitely true what you just said. Um, yeah, basically we are measuring minerals, compositions, of oxides. Um, however, uh, we are able to have the concentration of those elements, and when we compare the concentration of elements with the concentration in the bedrock and in the teal, we're pretty close uh, in concentration between the lake sediments and the bedrock and the teal. Uh, it's true that we don't have the ions or the available form uh, of nutrients for plants, and we hope one day we will have that. <laughs> um, but we get an idea of how um, potentially those elements can, can become available for plants. <laughs>